Welcome. In this video, I'll finally be diving into a long-awaited topic, how to use hexadecimal logic with the double-double algorithm. Before we get started, make sure you're already familiar with how the double-double algorithm works, as well as how comparators and hexadecimal logic work, because I'll be going into some deep, detailed explanations. I'll be using this image from the Wikipedia page on double-double as a reference throughout this explanation. The first step in the conversion to hex logic is to define a goal. My goal was to use hexadecimal numbers to represent the bits in between each conditional letter. In this image, all these little rectangles are the conditional letters, and they each have 4 bits as input and 4 bits as output, and it just so happens that one hex nibble can store exactly 4 bits of information. Let's break down each step of the double-double algorithm and figure out how to do it with hex logic. The simplest step is to check if the input is greater than 4. This can very easily be done with a comparator. This comparator will turn on when the input is under or equal to 4, and turn off when it's over 4. That's just the condition, though. Now we need to add 3 if the condition is met. Comparators can only subtract, but turning subtraction into addition is simple enough. First, you invert the number by subtracting it from the largest possible value, then you subtract 3 from that, and then you invert it again. This conditional ladder is complete. If we put a number equal to or less than 4, it will output the same number, but if it's above 4, then it will add 3 to the output. The other step in the algorithm is to double the number. Doubling can be done just by adding the number to itself, and we just learned how to add numbers. Subtract from the largest value, then we need to subtract the input value, and finally, subtract from the largest value again. But we still have one problem. Redstone dust is capped at a signal strength of 15, so if our number is greater than 7, and we try and double it, then we end up destroying data. So we'll need to implement a carry system. First, we'll check if our number is greater than 7. If it is, then we'll subtract 8 from our value and turn on the carry out signal. Then, we need to add the carry in. If the carry in turns on, then we need to add 1 to the final output of our number. So, let's just take these two steps and put them together. I'm going to test every combination of inputs and carry ins, and keep track of their outputs and carry outs to make a truth table. I have tested every possible input value, 1 through 15, which turns out to be unnecessary. The double-double algorithm never actually uses any values above 9, so we can safely ignore the inputs of 10 through 15. I'll take those out of the table, and that shortens the table to just this. And that's the final truth table. Creating this table was the most important discovery in the process of translating the double-double algorithm to hexadecimal logic. Technically, this ends up being decimal logic, not hexadecimal, because we only ever use the values 0 through 9. I'd like to illustrate a connection between this table and the original combinational double-double method. If we look at just one of the conditional letters, then we can match up our inputs, outputs, and carries to this image. These four bits here are the input, and these four match perfectly with the output. Now, what's interesting is that this bit matches with the carry out, and this bit matches with the carry in. If we draw these same boxes over the rest of the image, then we see that they overlapped in a weird way. Where these boxes overlap means that our redstone device actually has duplicate data. The data from the carry ins and carry outs is actually duplicated in the inputs and outputs of the neighboring modules. Look at this arrow on the end. It's coming straight from one of the binary inputs. That must mean we need to input our binary number directly into the carry ins. Let's hop into Minecraft and try it out. I'll take this module and stack it a few times. The double double image has this cascading effect with the conditional adders. The further along in the process you go, the more conditional adders you need. While my design is just a big grid of modules, it turns out that these modules in the corner are unnecessary. Their inputs and outputs will always be zero, so they can just be removed. It's much easier to stack the device in just a grid shape though, so I'll leave them there. In the simplest form, all you need is a module that follows this truth table, and then you just stack it in a grid. Outputs connected to inputs, and carryouts connected to carry ins. From here, it's just a matter of compacting it and making it faster. And trust me when I say, it can be a whole lot faster and a whole lot smaller. It just requires some clever tricks. If you're clever, you may have already thought of this first trick. In each module, we first check if the value is greater than 4, and if it is, then we subtract 3. After that, we check if the value is greater than 7 to determine if we should subtract 8. But any value greater than 4 plus 3 will always be greater than 7, so if we combine the checks, then we'll need to combine the results. The first check is to determine if we add 3, and the second check is to determine if we subtract 8. So combined, the checks are just to determine if we'll subtract 5. So the simplified condition is just, if the input is greater than 4, then subtract 5 and turn on the carry out. Interestingly, our conditional adder has just become a conditional subtractor. Meet Flying Dean. 
Flying Dean saw a post of mine about my discovery and decided to try it out himself. He brought along some of his own clever tricks and some much needed common sense. The first change he made was to make the design vertical. The input of each module is on the top and the output on the bottom. The carries are on the sides. The other change he made was directly to the truth table. He took the whole table and inverted every single signal strength. Inputs, outputs, and all the carries. Zero is now 15, and 15 is now zero. This may seem unintuitive, but in practice it makes a lot of sense. If the internal signal strengths of the machine are all inverted, then our long process for addition turns into just regular subtraction. The final output of the machine can be inverted one final time to recover the actual values. Things start to get a little confusing here, so it's important to follow the truth table very closely. From now on, I'll use the term signal strength to refer to the actual signal strength of the redstone dust, and I'll use the term value to refer to the corresponding value in the original table that that signal strength now represents. For example, while the dust signal strength might be 6, we interpret that as a value of 9 according to the original table. If you're familiar with hexadecimal logic, then you know that signal strength decay is bad. You can never place more than one dust in between components, or you're at risk of destroying information. Fortunately for us, this device uses decimal logic, not hexadecimal. We can afford to lose signal strength to decay, as long as we compensate for it later. If we look at the truth table now, we'll see that it uses the signal strengths 15 through 6 backwards. The signal strengths 0 through 5 are completely unused, so there's some wiggle room to shift around the numbers in there. I figured out that if we shift the truth table to use a signal strengths 10 through 1, then an input signal strength of 5 corresponds with a value of 5 as well. This is important because 5 is a cutoff point for the conditional subtractor, and this way we can do the conditional check with the same comparator that's providing the signal strength to be subtracted. If we take a look back at our doubling circuit, you'll see there are two comparators for the doubling, and then one comparator that's specifically for the carry-in. Our carry-in is in between the doubling comparators, so you may already be able to guess that it does not matter where the carry-in is positioned in this sequence. So what if we put it at the beginning? Then it will either provide a signal strength of 15 or 14 to the rest of the circuit. There's another component that can provide a signal strength of 15, the repeater. If we constantly provide a signal strength of 14, then we can toggle a signal strength of 15 just by toggling the repeater. With this setup, a single repeater controls the entire carry in logic. It turns out that not only is dust decay a non-issue, but it's actually a solution. If you think about it, dust decay is just instant subtraction of a constant number. If you place five dust in a row, then the output at the end is just whatever the signal strength was inputted, minus four. We can use this to test our greater than four condition instantly. In this setup, the dust will only turn on the repeater if the input is greater than four, and that repeater can just directly be our carry-in repeater. Tile take priority. You may have heard of it. You may know it as that weird mechanic that messes up your redstone devices, but nobody truly understands it. No one except for Uni. Uni gained interest in this project when she saw my original showcase video. She requested an explanation from me about how the device worked, and immediately started suggesting improvements, starting with the directionality issue. It turns out that my original showcase design had a problem where it would be one tick slower per bit when facing north or south. Uni immediately called out that issue and suggested that I use TTP to fix it. I won't go too deep into TTP now, but I'll leave a link in the description to a video by my friend AHA user that explains some of the basic concepts. Anyway, Uni and I came to the conclusion that the doubling comparators must be directly touching each other. This would not only mitigate the locationality issues, but it would also make it faster. In this configuration, these two comparators will power in a predictable order and only have a total delay of one redstone tick instead of two. I was of course fascinated by this concept, so I had to try and make the conditional adder faster too. I figured out that if I use a repeater for the condition, similar to the carry condition, then together the repeater and the comparator would have a total of one redstone tick delay. Unfortunately, these changes required the device to be one block longer, leaving the final product with a width of 7 blocks, but it's totally worth it for the sake of speed, and non-directionality. Let's take a look at the final version of the device, and I'll highlight all the components we learned about. We'll start at the top and follow the dust down. First, we see the two comparators in subtract mode. These two comparators are used for the doubling by subtracting the input twice. Don't worry about the signal strength decay between them, since we know we can compensate for that later. This repeater handles a carry ins. When it's on, the doubler gets an input strength of 15, and when it turns off, the signal strength of 14 is still supplied by the comparator on the other side. If we follow the dust down more, then we'll find the conditional logic. If we count from this red block, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then we'll see that the repeater here is 5 dusts away. This repeater controls the conditional subtraction. When it receives power, it powers the back of this comparator with 13 signal strength, and when it turns off, this comparator still receives 8 signal strength from here. The difference between those strengths is 5, which corresponds to the number subtracted if the condition was met. 
On the other side, we'll find the carry in repeater for the next layer. This repeater is also five dusts away from the input for this layer, so this will turn on and off along with that other repeater. Finally, this comparator performs an inversion to prepare the repeater for the doubler. And that wraps up everything. I've learned so much throughout the development of this device and from the incredible people who joined me along the way. I hope that this video will appease the people spamming, how does it work, in the comment section, and I hope that you enjoyed and learned a lot. I do have prototypes for a decimal to binary device using the same concept, and even devices for fractional binary conversion, so make sure you subscribe if you want to see those in the future. But for now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.